some, some issues about budgeting. Um, when you, you run a budget, you know, you've got to think about all the things that are involved in research, all the things that you might have to pay for, or to put it another way, the resources you need. Um, some of the exercise we do later on is in terms of pounds and pence and so on, um, but actually you don't need to think about that. You need to think about the resources you need. I mean, they, they come, there's a cost to those, uh, and the major cost, I have to say, in social research is people, is, is the staff you need. And that's the biggest cost by far, usually, for what we do. So social research is very different from natural research in that sense, because in natural you know, you know, physics and engineering and so on, the, the equipment costs a cost lot of money. Although you might argue that that's got embedded within it, the labour that produced it and so on, that people did. But in social research, we have relatively little equipment, but, but there's some that we need. Things like this recorder I'm using at the moment would be an example. But in the main, it's people. So you need to think through what the people are doing and how much they cost and, and you know, or how much of their time you need and so on. That's, that's the issue. So what kinds of people can we employ on research projects? Well, here's, here's some of those, those things. We, uh, you know, research assistants, research fellows, um, uh, senior research fellows, uh, those are the kind of people that get employed. And of course, yourself or a member of staff or whatever, so if I put a bid in, it, they'll be buying myself out as well um, now on that, particularly under the new regime we have. This is the, well, I think I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, the, the full economic costing approach, the FEC approach that we have, whereby people like me who contribute to a project in the past would have done it on, on the university's time. So the university would have been paying effectively uh, for that. But now it's done by buying myself out and, and paying effectively somebody else to do some bits of my work so I can work on the project. And the same is true for other, other people. So those are the major things to think about. And alongside identifying who they are, you have to think about how much they cost, and that's their salaries, and the extras that go on top of that. Uh, I mentioned uh, national insurance and increments and so on here. Um, in the, uh, in the budget. So national insurance is, um, I mean, obviously employees pay a bit of that, but the employer pays a much larger amount. This is what goes towards your eventual pension and so on, the state pension. So you have to allow some overheads on top of the salary. So it always costs more than the salary. And you have to allow for increments. Uh, and commonly in university employment um, and, and other, many other areas too, which follow the university lead, uh, you will find that staff get an increment each year, so they go up a bit on the scale. Now, I've actually got some scales to show you that, which we can use in the exercise. These are a little bit out of date, um, but that doesn't matter for our purposes. Grade 6 on the chart you've got, this is a, a, a chart that applies to all universities in the UK. So it's not just Huddersfield, this is a nationally agreed uh, university scale. It's obviously not up to date because it only goes up to 2009, so this year's figures would have been in there. Probably a slight increase due to you know, rate of inflation and so on. Um, but you can see, if you, look at, if you turn over to, to grade 7, um, and let's just look at the first column, which was what, what people were getting paid five years ago. Grade 6 is the research assistant. Sorry, a bit better than we thought. Grade 6 research assistant, grade 7 research fellow, that's the PhD, and grade 8 is the senior research fellow. That's the equivalent of a kind of lecturer, a senior lecturer salary, actually. So that's how much we get paid. So if you ever wanted to know, that's where we are. Um, and people like me and so on are on grades 9 and 10. So uh, you know roughly what's going on. Now, the important thing for the, for the exercise and for you to think about is grades 6, 7 and 8. In fact, grades 6 and 7 are the main ones. So that's the, um, the, the basic salaries. And you would need to add on to that um, the, um, the cost of much insurance and so on um, to get the cost of employing, or in fact paying somebody, perhaps I should say more strictly about that. But you need to think about other things too. Well, in fact, actually you don't these days. That's what's great about it, that somebody has to think about other things. These things here, training, accommodation, and so on. Now, the training might be something you do have to think about. If, if you think you're going to get a research assistant who maybe hasn't got the skills needed to do this, or more commonly, you're employing somebody else, perhaps as an interviewer, who needs to be trained to do the interviews you want, then you have to allow some time in your project for that. So if it is that kind of strange kind of approach,
approach that you know something unusual in, in say interviewing that you want to do, then you may have to train them yourself. That's not normally covered by anything else. So you need to think about that and include it in, in the, the, the costumes. But for many circumstances, you could say a research assistant of the right kind, and that would be somebody who's got a degree in social sciences, for example, should have at least the basic skills in how to interview. They would have done a degree that involves some empirical work, that involves doing a project or whatever in, for their you know, dis- third year, dis- final year dissertation, and therefore will have the skills you need. You won't need to train them specially in anything. So you don't have to worry so much about that. But you do have to, or someone has to worry about accommodation um, and, and other costs. And that's what this is about down here. <coughs> We're still looking at costing. Okay. The university charges extra on top of the salaries and overhead, if you like, to cover everything else that costs money in employing somebody. So the office they're in, uh, the heating of that office, the lighting, um, all the other services that go with that, you know, the, the kind of the campus support services and so on, open the building and lock it up at night and so on. Of course, the library, um, all the other admin that's needed to employ somebody. So somebody has to run the personnel section that pays the salaries and make sure he gets the check at the right time of the year and so on, those kind of things. Um, and of course, the general administration that runs the university as well, the vice chancellor and downwards from there, that their salaries have to be paid out of something, and that's what the overhead's about. So we use what's called full economic costing now to do that, and each university has a figure it applies. Um, that's it's, it's, ra- it's by arrangement with, with Hefke as to what that figure is. Uh, it's based upon statistics of how much costs are at Huddersfield. And so when you do it through a university, their finance office will add that number in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the cost of all those things that, that, that are extra. And it's normally, well, I've said here, 40 50 percent that's, that's the range it tends to be. Um, but so you will need to find out what that is if you were to do a bid. I mean, obviously not today, <laughs> but you can assume it's going to be about that amount. Um, but if you were doing it for real, you would actually contact the university's finance office or whoever else was doing it. If you work for a hospital, they do the same. Contact the finance office and find out what their economic costing overheads are, and just put that onto the budget. How how is the finance working when you have just an example? You might have something like. I often read things like ICI in conjunction with the Huddersfield University or yeah. some organisation like that. But where's the funding fitting in there? <laughs> it gets tricky. Uh, there's various ways it can happen. It depends exactly what's going on. Um, for example, we have things, I don't know what they're called, there's a, a PhD studentship scheme that's, is it a case award, I think? It might be called a case award. Um, which is usually done with a private company in some way. And what happens there is that the company provides the position for the student, you know, they provide the room and the place they work and so on, but they're registered at the university and get tuition at the university for their PhD, it's usually a PhD studentship. Um, and so the student gets a grant, they get paid for you know, living fee, etc. they get their fees paid, and the company supports that by giving them somewhere to work, and somewhere, a lab to work in, and it's very often science things, a lab to work in, things like that. And of course the, the company gains from that by you know, having access to the results of their, their study. That's the very simplest one. More complex ones involve companies collaborating with a, with a research project, you know, the company I might bid for. Um, and in which case, there's a variety of ways a company can, can be involved. They could offer personnel, um, or they could offer machinery and so on. And often both those things are done in kind. So you say, you know, we're going to bid for this much money, on the project will cost us £3 million pounds to do, but we're going to bid for £2 million because £1 million of that will come from the company in kind. And they will provide staff to work on the project, or they will provide the machinery and the equipment that's needed and so on possibly even the premises to work in. So that's their contribution in kind. And of course the quid pro quo is that the company gains from the research that's done. They get the results of the research and so on that they want done. So that, that's how it's often done. Um, a, a, a similar thing is being done now um, on, for example, GISC projects. And I've just got a grant uh, this year from GISC, that's the Joint Information Systems Committee, that funds a lot of computing research. What we're looking at, I'm doing this jointly with people at Birmingham, what we're looking at is um, the use of, or ways in which we can encourage academics and students to use open education resources. These are things that are on the internet that can be used to, to learn. Um, so it's looking at the mechanisms for, for encouraging um, the, the use of those. 
Um, and the funding is a 50-50 split. GISC pays half the money, and the other half is expected to come from the university. And we do that in kind. So we have staff working on it who are effectively staff paid for by the university, who some of whose time is then used on the project, effectively for free, as far as the project's concerned. But some of it we are paying. So we have a research assistant, for example, on the project, who's based in, in, in Birmingham, and she's paid from the project. So half the money goes to pay her, or not quite half of it, but a bit, bit goes to pay me as well, actually. Um, and, and our researcher here. Um, but um, half the money is coming in kind in other kind of ways. So that's, that's a typical way that you find that funding done. As, as for giving money, usually companies don't do that. Sometimes they do do a bit of money. They might buy some equipment for a project, for example, and that's their only input, is to buy that gear. Uh, and then, of course, they get access to the results and so on. So there's a, there's a range of different ways in which that, that collaboration can be done. And I have to say, it's often looked at, looked at very, very encouragingly by, or, or perhaps I should say, the, the funders encourage that kind of collaboration. They want you to collaborate with companies uh, in that kind of way. Um, and um, it's, you know, you can help the bid succeed if you have that kind of collaboration. Okay, so that's, that's the staff cost then. So beware that, you know, of how much extra it costs. I mean, the National Insurance might add 10% on, then you add another 40 to 50% on. You can see that the costs go up quite a bit from the salary itself into in, in the project. We need to allow for that in the company. And of course, then we do need some equipment. Uh, what kind of equipment might you need to, to do the job? Um, well, computers is the most common one. Just about every bit I've heard made always includes some computers for the researchers. So if you employ somebody or you employ yourself, you might want to have some equipment to work on for that project. And so if it's a new member of staff, you'd have to buy them something to work on. Um, and that's not normally included in the accommodation. For some reason, they're separated. They'll get a desk, they'll get an office, that's part of the overheads, but they won't get the computer necessarily. So you need to think about that as well. And of course, there's other things too, like tape recorders for interviews, MP3 recorders, like the one I've got here, and um, this kind of thing. That's, they're, they're really useful. They're not cheap either. How do you think? How much do you think that costs? I don't know if you might have you might have looked it up. But <laughs> are you just guessing? <laughs> just guessing. It's nearly 200 quid. Yeah. So it, they're not cheap. Um, good quality digital record, and that is a good quality one. Not the best, necessarily. Um, I've looked at some reviews for others. There are better ones that cost about £250. Um, but if you're doing interviews, it's quite important to get good, good quality recordings. Good microphone, and that's got a built-in microphone on top that's very, very good quality. That helps enormously, or even a tip-on mic, like I've sometimes used. Um, and... Um, and a good quality recording itself, and that, that does MP3 or WAV files, which are CD quality of recording. So it's worth thinking about that. Um, you might need other specialist equipment for, I don't know, what, what else social scientists need. I mean, psychologists might need something, perhaps, but most of us, that's it really, isn't it? I mean, that's it's pencil and paper and things like that. But you might run onto other, to other things like uh, printing costs, and if you're going to produce you know, various reports or you need questionnaires down on, on paper and things like that, you need to obviously cost that in postage to post them out. Quite importantly, you might need to think about travelling as well. If you're going to do interviews in various places, someone's got to get to the place to do the interviews. So they've got to pay, you know, either they've got to bribe their car and get some petrol to do it, or they've got to pay training and so on to get there. So you've got to allow for those costs. So you have to do a calculation of how many journals, how far, sorry, how many journeys, and how far, and so on. And that's actually quite hard to do, because very often at the bid stage, you've no idea where the interviewees will be. So you have to take a, a guess, and that's what you'll be doing later on, because that's part of the exercise, is to look at those kinds of costs. Um, Library access too sometimes costs money. Um, there's even been efforts here recently at Huddersfield to make sure that bidders for money put in to the bid the cost of interlibrary loans. So if, you, if your research involves you doing lots of interlibrary loans to get hold of the papers you need to read to write up your report, that costs the, the library money and that actually the library will then charge the project for that. That's your cost in there. Other things to think about that cost money uh, or, or uh, I resource you need are consumables. Um, I mean, tapes used to be one of the major things to think about for doing interviews. You want to record them, you have to buy tapes. These days, um, recorders like this use memory cards, tiny little um, secure digital uh, SD memory cards. 
Um, the one I've got in here, for example, is I think 16 gigabytes and it costs 20 quid. 16 gigabytes of MP3 recording, well, you can work it out for yourself. It's, I don't know, several years worth of recordings, I think. It'll last you for the whole project. But it's worth getting a few because you might want to give them out to people and, and so on. Um, and of course, make sure you back them up later as well. That's why you need a computer to back it all up as well. <laughs> so, actually, consumables aren't a big cost either for a lot of what we do. Clerical costs you might need. The big one here, by the way, is transcription costs. If you want, if you're doing interviews and want them transcribed, then that costs money. And you know, clerical costs would include that. So, I mean, one way of doing that is to employ a, a copy typist or audio typist to transcribe for you. And if you were doing a bid and you could do that, I would advise that. As a postgraduate researcher, you may have to transcribe your own interviews, perhaps the assessments on your masters or on your PhD and so on. Um, I'm afraid that's because you won't have the money unless you're rich to pay somebody else. But if you can apply for the money, I'd definitely recommend that. And I've always done that in the last few years at least. The last one I did by hand was, I think, 15 years ago. It was a painful experience. And since then, I've managed to find the money in the research bids to pay somebody else to do it for me. To give it an expert time perspective, doing a very good time so that's clerical costs. Um, you might want to employ researchers, uh, you know, people to do interviews, for example, especially just to do the interviews, nothing else. And that might be to do interviews linked with the survey or to do, you know, unstructured interviews, depth interviews, if you like, uh, or whatever. Um, and, of course, you need to train them, perhaps, to do that. But in addition, you might think about not employing a person full-time, maybe not getting the research system to do it, but having somebody in part-time. So you need to work out how many hours of their work you need to do that. So there may be part-time people as well. You might think about contingency, things that you haven't thought about. Now, usually these days you can't include on the budget an item that says contingency. That, that isn't allowed. So what you have to do is think about the other things that you put in and think, have we put enough in here? Could we put something else in? Um, there's not a lot you can change. You have to say when you go back to it. If you look at these, the previous ones here, the staff cost, you can't add a contingency onto this. That is the actual staff cost, except in one area, and that is in the scale point you appoint to. So you notice when you look at these scales, scale six starts as PT23 and goes up to PT30. You could say we're going to appoint somebody in the middle of the scale, but let's allow us to go up to the top of the scale. So you might actually put in a bid based on 25,633 from five years ago. Um, but actually, when it comes down to it, you point at a lower level. That gives you an automatic contingency. You've got a few thousand pounds left over. And normally, if you need it, perhaps if you want more, more for travel, you can normally via it. That is, move it across from one area to another. You're normally allowed to via in that way. Viring is that term. Have you heard of viring? Is the word? No. Viring is the term, it's a financial term. It means moving funding from one heading to another. You said you're going to spend it on that, but actually you want to spend it on that instead. So you via it across. Um, and you're allowed to do that. So that's how you get a contingency in, is making sure that you are fairly liberal, if you like, in the way you estimate your costs. Make sure that you overcover yourself um, in doing that. Don't do it you know, too much, because in the end, you'll be judged on how well you have, have funded it. Um, if, you, if you overclaim, they'll say it's too expensive, you can't, you can't have it. Um, and in fact, I've just had a, a, a bid rejected. I got an email a, a day or two ago and we had some discussion. We got some feedback today on it. And one of the things they said was it wasn't value for money, effectively. We were asking for too much to do the work that we were possibly to do. And that, that often happens. That's one of the reasons they can turn you down. And as I said, I think last week, most bids don't succeed. So there we are. Another one I haven't succeeded on. But sometimes you do. And you have to keep on bidding. Um, so contingency. Uh, another thing to think about is to, to, when you estimate things, is it always takes longer than you think to do things. So a common way of estimating is to work out how much one costs and then multiply out by how many you're doing. So if you're doing 30 one-hour interviews, that will take 30 hours for the one-hour interview, but you have to also allow time for travel and so on. That might be an extra hour for each interview. So it's going to take 60 hours to do the whole thing. And therefore, you need to work out you've got to employ somebody for 60 hours to do that, or they're going to have 60 hours worth of their time in your budget or in your um, plan of activities to do that work. 
but of course it always takes longer than that um, to do it. So, you know, things go wrong, you know, trains break down, as we know from the last couple of weeks, that the ice and the snow stops them travelling, etc. It takes longer to do things. So allow a bit extra. So when you estimate those things, allow perhaps, you know, um, an extra you know, um, uh, 50% on it or something like that for, for whatever it is you're calculating. Again, transcription. Um, I think I might have said elsewhere, six to eight hours for transcribing. So allow the upper figure, eight hours at least, maybe longer. For the fact, that's how much you have to pay somebody if you're going to be a transcriber. How much? It, it, maybe even more than that if it's a research assistant doing it for you. Um, and don't forget the time it takes to do analysis and write up. This is much more difficult to estimate, and it's it's a very hard one to do. This is not something that you can do necessarily. But I had a conversation with a colleague recently about this very issue. About she was bidding for some some funding and um, want to know kind of how much things would cost. And one of the things I said to her was, you know, your experience with, with supervising PhD students, you know how much work a PhD student can do in three years. Why not estimate it on that basis? You know, you're asking me to do this, that and the other, do some data collection, do some analysis, do some writing up, read some literature and so on. How much did it take a PhD student to do that kind of amount of work? Um, and of course she found that quite easy to do because she was experienced and used to doing that. I'm afraid that's the only way you can, you can actually in the end do this kind of thing, just building up experience from either from having done it yourself as a research assistant or from having supervised people or worked with people on projects. You get, gradually you get to have a feel of how long it takes to do those things, those imponderables of you know, reading literature, writing stuff up, analysing data and so on. You can do the breakdown method like this, you know, break it down to, into stages if, you, you know, if, if you're familiar with that, and that might help a bit, give you kind of ballpark figures, but... You know, there are different ways of approaching that. But don't underestimate how long it takes. I mean, you know, I've said here a third of the time, a third of all the time for the project for analysis. Analysis takes an awful lot of time to do. So particularly if you're doing qualitative analysis, I and mean, that's really tedious. Um, and it often can be more than that. So and of course writing up, you've got to write the reports and write your papers and write kind of stuff as well. Allow time for that. Okay. Um, Right, so budget examples. I've got quite a lot of these, and I'll talk you through what, what they're about. Here's some I took from a book on, in fact, it's Martin Rossman's book, I think, on designing positive research. These are quite out of date, so bear that in mind. Um, so the date on it, 1990. They're 20 years out of date, so the salaries are nothing like real. But of course, it's all comparative, we just simply increase them by rate of inflation, whatever. Let me explain some of the terminology in this. And this particular project, it lasted, or it was going to last, five years. So if you look at table 6.2, um, staff and staff time by year and task, um, you can see that you've got several different tasks, looks like five, six tasks altogether, not all happening all the time. Some are happening at some point and then stopping, others starting and so on, some going right the way through. Uh, task 2 happens almost all the way through. Um, and you've got more than one person working here. You've got the column headed PI. I think I said this last week, that's a principal investigator. So that's normally the person who made the bid, usually. But they're the main person working on the principal investigator. And there's a co-PI. So that's somebody working alongside them, a, 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 a co-principal investigator. Um, and the figures here are telling you days per, per site, the number of days work they're putting in um, for each year and for each task. In addition, you've got seven evaluators working on it as well, um, doing some work in, in the project. So here's a way of kind of adding up all the days involved in that. And I think I'm often saying that the one on the right-hand side is the same set of, of, of figures, the five-year project, showing you when it's happening. So now, the, um, the task numbers, um, yes, you have to look at the other table. Table 6.1 lists the task numbers um, that are going on here. And you can see they overlap with the listings on the right-hand table, 6.1. So that's, table 6.1 gives you the actual tasks involved, and, and this is the, the numbers 1 to 6, that's what they're about. And you can see, perhaps, why 6 comes near the end of the project. It's more about analysis, reporting and so on, so you expect it to come near the end of the project. 
whereas one is data gathering, and therefore you expect that more often near the beginning of the, the five-year project. Okay. Now, the chart on figure 6.1 is to show when things are happening. So rather than showing the tasks, they show the actual activities down the left-hand side, year by year, and they give either a line, a horizontal line showing continuing activity across several months. So the data gathering, for example, starts in March of year one, and it carries on through into June, and then year two starts in July. These, these by the way, are our academic financial years. That the academic financial year starts in July, is odd. Um, not like any others. But you can see data analysis then carries on right way through to May um, in the following year two. <coughs> the crosses indicate particular events. And of course, most of these are meetings. So you can see they've got the Department of Education meetings, DOE, obviously an education project. And they've got the RAs meeting, the research assistance meetings. I suspect these are the evaluators who are working. Yeah. So it's useful to have actually to have both of those when you're, when you're doing a project. And certainly when, if, um, when you do the assessment on this model, the, the proposal, it's useful to have some kind of chart looking rather like 6.1, showing when things are happening and what they are and, and when they're going to happen you know, across your project. These are actual, the actual costs. Quite historic now, of course. But it gives you some idea of how they you know, they basically worked out how much we need of each person or how many people and so on. And there you are. A mere £25,000. That's a bargain these days. It may be, what, ten times that much now, I guess, by comparison. But notice also other direct costs they've got in there. Interviewers' travelling expenses, researchers' travelling expenses, printing costs. They would print to be less these days, printing costs. A lot of it's done on the internet instead. So you, you, or you publish PDFs rather than print them out. Um, photocopying, again, that's, that's much less often done. But you might need to print things. If you're doing a server, you might want to have printed versions of the, the questionnaire, for example. They have put in a contingency here. And as I said, that's not usually allowed these days. Um, so I wouldn't worry, wouldn't even try that one. And notice the cost for university. That's what the overhead's about. You don't have to specify that now. That's what FEC is all about. Actually, this is one the student did in their assessment. So here's a previous year's student who did one like this. Very simple kind of chart showing when things were happening. It doesn't show the costs, doesn't show the people needed here, but it does show when the activities are happening. In fact, the reason why this student didn't show the people was because it was them. It was just them doing it full time. And it was their project effect. <coughs> What's going on here? You've got the design and pilot interview starts in January. And a couple of weeks, and the cross crosses, one cross could be a week, so two weeks in Jan, two weeks in Feb, total of four weeks to design and pilot interview. A couple of weeks to recruit participants, and it overlaps a bit um, with the, uh, uh, this, although, oh no, 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 it doesn't actually overlap, it's only just two weeks. Interviews does overlap though with transcription, so we've got four weeks doing interviews that start in March, and that overlaps, uh, overlaps rather, a bit with the uh, transcription data input. As you might expect, you do the interviews and then in the afternoon you start transcribing and so on. And of course that takes quite a time, it carries on into April, and that overlaps again with the beginning of analysis. Having got some transcripts, you can start to analyse them, and then that carries through quite a long period of analysis, which is also overlapping with the report writing period. Here. <coughs> it's a very simple diagram, but it does make you think carefully about what's needed and, and so on. I have to say, in my experience of marketing these over many years is that people often underestimate how long it takes to do some of these things. Particularly, I've said this already, the analysis and report writing, but often interviewing is underestimated too, and what kind of interviews you're doing and where they are and so on. But um, that's, that's, uh, those are areas which are hard to deal with. Okay, so that's an example of a, a real project, albeit from uh, 20 years ago, um, and the, the way it was laid out with um, the, the timings and, and so on, and the resources needed. Let's look at one or two other examples. Well, in fact, if I go back to the lecture and talk about these issues here, that might be worthwhile, because um, these appear on, on the charts. Um, what you can put on charts, things like staging posts, milestones, deadlines. And actually, for some project now, you need to do that. When you make the bid, you have to specify these points. Milestones is the word that's commonly used these days. So that means there will be something that's done and finished by that stage. It might be, milestone is to finish the interview. 
or it might be milestone is to finish the uh, negotiations about access or something like that, or it might be the milestone is to produce an interim report on so and so, but something that's done and finished at that point. And so you can, you can put those on, on those, those time programs. Um, I've said some of these things already, break down small sets, double estimates. Um, training, recruiting, response times. Yeah, when you're laying out the timing for things, don't forget to allow time for all the imponderables. It always takes longer to do something than you think. And some of the things you need to think about are training people, I've said this already, training people for new training, but recruiting them, and that's a big bugbear for a project. I've, I've suffered from this many times over. If you employ a new research assistant or a new, new research fellow, you have to recruit them. And that means a whole process you have to go through. You have to go through committees at the university, you have to advertise, you have to um, interview, make the offer, and then perhaps if you get turned down, you know, interview somebody else and so on. Um, and that can happen, and it can delay projects for three months or even longer just to go through that whole process. So make sure you allow for that if you possibly can. It's not always possible to do that, something you have to start at some point, but, but don't you know, think you can get away without that. Response times, things like you know, sending out questionnaires, you need to people time to think, get things back in again, and that takes time as well. That, you're not doing anything, you're just waiting for stuff to happen, so allow yeah. for that. So I've already said data transcription I've talked about, analysis leaving time for. Um, oh yes, cross-check when resources are needed. I mean, this is a common one. This has cropped up on several projects I'm involved with when, uh, when you're doing research in schools, for example. The children aren't there in the vacation, so if you're, you're wanting to observe classroom activities, you can't do it over the summer. You can't do it over the Easter period because they're closed for three weeks and so on. So, so allow for that. Yeah. Um, so uh, allow for that in the project, at the time you're doing in the project. You can use charts as well. I've shown you one chart. That was one end of the, the extreme, the, the, uh, the one done by the student. Um, here's the other extreme. This is one that I got involved with. What you're looking at, the chart there, is a, what's called a Gantt chart. It was very large, and I made it much smaller to fit it onto the page. So you probably can't even read the details. But essentially, on the left-hand side, are a series of what are called work packages. This is the new terminology we tend to use these days. JISC is using it, the European Union is using it, and so on. Work packages are clumps of activity that you do on a project. So it's breaking down all the activity you do into, you know, in a sense, self-contained clumps. So gathering data might be a work package. Um, you know, um, sorting out dissemination might be a work package, and so on. So lots of activities go on within the package, and that's what WP1, WP2, and so on are here. I'm sorry, you, you probably can't read the smaller print, but it's not to show you that so much. In fact, it's on the later pages on the handout. If you turn over on table B3, the second page, that's the listing of the work packages. So you can see a scoping package, an investigation of assessment, developing technical constraints, development environmental constraints, and so on, case study policy, all those kind of things, lots of activities. It was a very big project, by the way, there's several, I think about two or three million euros. Um, be four. Notice also in uh, table 4B, a deliverables list, is what I was saying about, these are typical deliverables, reports, you know, workshops, and so on, those kind of things, lots of documents being done by a certain point, being delivered by that point, so there's finishing activities. And look on the last page is a more detailed description of a work package. So here's give you, you know, the objectives of the package. This, this package was what? Sc scoping, number one. Um, description of what it's doing, you know, obviously workshops and food and things like that. Deliverables, three deliverables, and there are some milestones attached with that, and it tells you when they are. Now that's just one work package. We had eleven of them, so there are eleven documents like that that were produced. And they were broken down into sub-activities, which is what appears on the chart on the front. So underneath the headings are the things you can't read in a very small print, and those. Now what the chart does is show when those things happened across time. So moving from left to right across the chart, the, the x-axis, is time. <clears throat> and when there's a solid line, it means you're doing something. So one of those things, either the work package or some subset of it, if you just look at the first one, work package one at the very top, you can see the solid line at the top tells you when, that, when that's happening. And below it, there's a complicated cluster of things which are the sub-activities within that work package. 
that are going on. Um, and the thing about Gantt charts is you can have lines that link things together to form a critical path. That is, things that have to be finished before other things can start, or things that have to lead on to other things. And that's what the arrows are doing, showing when you've done that, it leads into that activity and so on. So we finish that, we can now use those results here. And so on. But of course, some overlap as well. You can allow, can allow overlapping activities, as you can see. Uh, right down the bottom, work package, um, what is it, uh, nine, um, which I can't read. Pre, can you read that? Pre development. Yeah, my eyes are not quite good enough to see that. Um, that's obviously going on all the time, all the way through, the, or most of the, the years of the project. Now, I won't expect anything like that from you. If you're a wizard doing programs, you've got a copy of Microsoft Project, for example, you can actually produce that if you want to, but I don't expect that. All I expect is something much simpler like the one I just showed you um, in, in the project. But that might be something you get involved with at some stage. Um, I have to say this was done, I think I said this the other week, this was done by a four-time research fellow who worked on it for several months to do all the bidding and, and writing and coordination and so on. And this is one of the she produced. So that's the other extreme, if you like, of the, um, that, that the process. The other thing I've got here is another example of work packages. And this is one that I was doing. This is a form that comes from GIST. We, we actually use this on a project I did last year. Another one year project funded by GISC. <clears throat> and you actually get a form like this online. This is what they ask you to fill in. So you can't escape the whole work package idea. But you can see there's a listing of each work package. And then just like I showed you the charts, you have to fill in which month you're going to do the work packages. So it's a kind of simple way of producing that Gantt chart that I just showed you, or of doing this. Same kind of principle. So it's very common. And on the other side of that sheet, it shows you the, the blank form again, which you have to fill in to describe each work package. So to say what the package is, what its name is, and then what the tasks are within that, so the details of doing it. And notice also the columns, like when you're going to start it, when you're going to finish it, what the outputs are, what the milestones will be, and so on. So these terminologies come up all the time in, in making bits. So it's as well to be aware of what they are. This is um, a project I did, well, you can see the date of it, 2006 7. This was a successful application this time. <coughs> um, I've got the time for three years like this. And this is a summary of what we asked for, the funding we asked for, and how we did it. This is actually, what I've done here is cut and paste from the actual bid we made, just the, the financial bits, so you can see what it looked like. <coughs> the bid came from me and two other academics. And we costed our time into it, as you'll see if you look over. Um, Joe Bloggs is me, um, and um, Jim Smith and Sam Evans, these are pseudonyms you might realise, uh, were the other people working with me. Um, and that's the costing, that's, that's a fraction of my salary at that time, or the, actually not my salary, that's the full cost with the overheads and everything else onto it. Um, and, um, then we also had a project worker so who we hadn't appointed when we started the project. In fact, it took us at least two months to appoint that person, so we were delayed in, in starting. Um, <clears throat> and so that's the salary for the project worker who assisted. And in fact, we, we, um, we say here, research system grade 7.31. Now, that actually is the first grade of research fellow. Remember I said, you know, allowing for a slightly higher salary than you might actually appoint at. So we thought we'd appoint a research assistant, but we allowed ourselves to appoint right at the top of the scale and one point up into research fellow. And in fact, we did appoint a research fellow, uh, somebody who had finished a PhD, what we got. So in fact, we appointed at grade 31. <clears throat> Notice also that goes up year by year. So it starts at 14,400, goes up to 15,000, and then to 15,493, and that's the increments. So that grade 30, that point 31 would go up to point 32, yet following point 33 the year after that. <clears throat> and of course, that is the academic financial years that that goes up. And if your project is starting at another time, so this project started in October, then you don't have another full year. It's only a part of the year at one salary, and part of the year at the increment point, and so on. That's what the finance people will do for you. They'll work out exactly what that is and how it works out. But it does go up 
year project. Now. So the three-year project, this one. Um, and Sam Evans and Tom Blair were two colleagues in other universities who <coughs> were doing basically a point five, which is um, one day a fortnight. Okay, in addition, you can see we're allowed for, um, I'm looking on page two now, we allow for equipment, IT and software equipment, that was back to just computer. Um, we ran workshops, or are running workshops, we're still doing this actually. Um, so we had to pay either to hire the rooms um, to, to run the workshops, or to go to them, to pay people to travel to them and so on. So we wanted to work for that, and we wanted to be able to give out handouts and so on, so we got stuff for printing. We had some incentives in there to, to help students uh, do some evaluation work for us, so we offered prizes or, you know, this is actually coupons and things like um, gift vouchers and things like that, you know, <coughs> five pound voucher for Marks and Spencer or something like that. Um, <coughs> and we had, now the, the next one down, the office running cost and overheads is the FEC, the Full Economic Costing. <coughs> and there were three universities involved here. Each had their own overheads, effectively, slightly different, around about 40-50%, but slightly different from university to university. Um, these are made up university names, by the way, uh, Greenfield, Dorset, and Medford, um, but it was three universities. <coughs> and they are pro rata as well to how much staffing. So um, I came out as, as, as working much more on the project, so there's more money uh, to pay me, um, and consequently a, a bigger overhead for uh, or that university, so that Greenfield, or actually Huddersfield, if you, if you work it out, not pretty obvious. Um, I won't tell you what the others are. Um, but they had less on their staffing, so, so smaller overheads. Oh, yeah, and the other overhead on, on me was, of course, the research, the project worker who was working here, so there's an overhead attached to, to that post as well. And on to other things digital videotapes. Um, this was, this was done, what, four years ago, this bid? This is before we had these MP3 recorders. I wouldn't put that now. I'd put um, recording, you know, digital cards, SD cards or whatever on there. Advertising, you have to advertise the post, you need money to pay for that, and so on. So you can see that's how it went. Now notice back on the first page, we've got the activities and how long they took, or how long they would take, as we were saying then. <clears throat> we broke it down to four, six exemplars. Um, and other activities and that, those are the months we, we, we thought we'd be doing them and that's how we would do them. And those are something that is like reporting at conferences was between weeks 18, sorry, months 18 and 36 of the project. That wouldn't take that whole period, that would just be the odd day going to a conference and reporting on what we've done and so on. <clears throat> or writing an article it might take a week to do in that period, something like that. <clears throat> And then the other thing we had to do, which is a bit of a, a new one for me, um, but I have, have done this since with others, is risk management. And it actually was quite useful to do it. The last page covers this. We had to say how it might go wrong, how things might fail to happen. And, for example, we might have insufficient case studies available. Um, so, you know, we... We thought the action we'd take was to recruit more. There'd be lots of PhD students. And in fact, we did find it a problem. We found it a real problem to recruit people. We lost some. Um, we lost at least four people that we recruited and started with, and they left and didn't, didn't finish. So we had to recruit other people, as are the case studies, to, to analyze. So that was a real risk, and, and we, we, we addressed how to do it. So you can see some of the other risks that we identified there. Uh, and it's, again, an issue for you bidding to work out what the risks might be and be honest about it and then say how you might deal with it if it happens. What you don't want is something to happen that you can't fix, that you can't deal with in some way, because that undermines the whole project. The risk, risk analysis is getting quite common on bids now as well. But certainly the other details, the activities and the project budget, are pretty much universal <coughs> on the project bid. You need to produce both of those, saying when things are done, and of course if you're asking for money, how much it will cost. I should say that for the assessment on this module, you don't need to talk about money. When you talk about resources, you can talk about people and how much time. Don't worry about you know, salaries and, and, and real costs and so on. And that's not needed. What, what you do need to say is how much of it you need. So you know, one person a day for this period or whatever, or I need this equipment to do this and so on. But don't worry about how much it costs. And that's actually, usually, costing things is a fairly simple process. It's working out what you need that's the hard bit.